Your brother may never have that chance to tell his side of the story. Are you sympathetic to that? Yes, 100%. And I think, you know, after, after I've done this, the book comes out, I would hope that other members of the family feel as though they can write their own book. Harry knows there won't be any counter-response in the foreseeable future, which is why the interviewer asked the question in the first place. Harry's response is very telling. Rather than take accountability, he continues praising himself, as if what he's done paves the way for dialogue and freedom, when obviously the opposite's the case. Because all we've heard are Meghan and Harry's monologues, documenting that they aren't free, but very much trapped in the victim role they've created for themselves. Do you think that this book is going to bring them back, or are they going to further divide you? I have thought about it long and hard, and as far as I see it, the divide couldn't be greater. The question was about whether or not the book would divide them further. Harry's saying that he doesn't think that the divide could be any further than it was before the book isn't an excuse for writing it. But I genuinely believe that if me and my family can reconcile, can put our differences behind us, but first there needs to be conversation and accountability, and if that doesn't happen, then that's very sad. But I will focus on my, my life. Here, I Harry believe. prefaces believe with genuinely, that he genuinely believes. But what is it that he genuinely believes? Interestingly, he doesn't tell us. He's Both right in the middle of a conditional clause, starting with soul. if, Compo when he makes an abrupt self-repair and inserts the conjunction but, initiating a contrast us, instead. This way, it isn't his unspecific repetitions of reconciliation that are assigned focus. It's the accountability he assigns focus. He and then goes on happen, to talk about if it doesn't sad, happen, suggesting that he knows my... it's not going to happen. And thus, that his talk about conversations and reconciliation has about as much depth and urgency as an episode of She-Hulk. With his second but, but conjunction, my, he assigns focus life. to his life rather than the presumed sadness he would feel if reconciliation doesn't happen. In conclusion, Harry's focus is Harry. His language reveals as much. I'm not angry anymore. There are things that will still anger me, but I'm not angry anymore because I am exactly where I'm supposed to be. They've done interviews, documentaries, books. But what are all these about? They're about the past and trying to clear their names. Everything they do, directly or indirectly, has to do with their past in the UK. So even though both of them act like they're done with the past and that they're happier than ever, their many reactions to old articles demonstrate that they're stuck in the past and that they need to hold on to the past in order to make money. Anyone can look happy in a photograph, but once again, there's a discrepancy between Harry's words and actions. Recently, you lost your grandmother. Did she ever express that she was upset at you? For what? Harry's response is consistent with what we already know about him and Meghan. That they don't feel or pretend not to feel responsible for what they've done. They made the decision, and they're now facing the predictable consequences of that decision. But their sense of entitlement doesn't allow them to admit that, publicly at least. Do you, do you think that right now there is an active uh, campaign by uh, the rest of your family, by the royal house as it were, to undermine this book and, and you yeah, as you support it? Of course, and, and mainly by the British press because they but are- But aided and abetted by yeah, the palace. again, of course, but there's, there's, this is the other side of the story, right? After 38 years. They've told their side of the story, this is the other side of the story. This isn't so much the other side of the story as it's Harry's side of the story. The one that he wants people to buy, literally. Just because the Netflix documentary invited us in, it doesn't mean that we saw what things were actually like inside. We saw and heard their version of reality, whatever reality or image they want to present to the world. We were forced to leave. We left in 2020. We moved out, we fled my home country, we moved to California, and for 12 months it was relentless. He conveniently forgets that he and Meghan were the ones who made a decision. The decision to leave their senior roles. All events and decisions after that were predictable consequences of that decision. 
Because he would have known about these consequences, this undermines Harry's pathos appeals to emotion and pity with words like forced and fled and the connotations these words create. But I guess more recently, especially in the last six years, it is all the, the, the fracture of the relationship between me and my brother has, always, has, has very much been pinned on my wife, um, funnily enough. This can surprise him. He himself wrote that Meghan was the reason for the fight between the two of them. He himself wrote about the heated discussions between William and Meghan. I, through this book, have been the most vulnerable I have ever been in my life. Um, and I've never felt stronger. People who are truly strong rarely have a need to mention it. People who are strong and have a fantastic life here in California. typically don't dedicate a documentary and book to point fingers and convince everyone that they're fine. That's a deluded sense of strength. Obviously, there are unresolved issues, and these issues make it hard to trust the lasting nature of this strength. As a result of this, the parts of the interview that are meant to serve as comic relief take on a darker meaning and aren't as funny as they could have been had Harry not had these unresolved issues. You got frostbite. Frost nip. Frost nip. Frost nip. Frost nip on a delicate part of your anatomy. <laughs> and you write about this in the book, when you went to the North <laughs> now Pole. They're in, now they're interested. Okay. <laughs> it wasn't like that. Never? No. Well. Uh... <laughs> okay, so it's, it seems okay. It's fine now, thank you. Um, so the... the <laughs> If you need to know any other words, I think the Austin yes. Powers uh, yes. sequence is a very good... Yes. The uh, Tower of London. Exactly. <laughs> That's new. Big Ben. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's right, you, you carry on. You were doing great, you were doing great. Oh, you're doing great. <laughs> well, There's some people here who are, sh who are horrified. Most of them are amused. Okay. <laughs> He talks and acts like any other celebrity on the show, but it comes across as imitation, that he presents an image he wants people to associate him with in order to convince the same people that he's better than ever, when clearly his own language and behavior indicate that this isn't the case. Looking at his interviews, books, and documentaries that all center on the royal family, he's stuck in the past. The interviewer, Bradby, says that Harry has more than just burned his bridges. Harry's response is telling. He starts with the discourse marker well, indicating that disagreement or modification is about to follow. And then he shifts from the pronoun you that Bradby introduced to they talking about his family. The question was about Harry, but Harry makes a pronoun shift and lets the interviewer know who he wants them to focus on instead, his family. He places the burden on them. Also, notice the logic. The claim is that Harry has more than burnt his bridges, a claim that Harry doesn't directly dispute. All he does is modify it with the marker well and the following words that make up the grounds to his claim, that his family show no willingness to reconcile. The warrant, how a speaker gets from grounds to claim, then becomes that because his family hasn't shown willingness to reconcile, it's understandable or even okay that he's more than burnt his bridges. In other words, Harry unintentionally suggests that he isn't actually interested in reconciliation either. This passage reveals how Harry views himself in relation to his family. Harry says that he has a lot of compassion. Compassion as to why certain family members are close to the tabloid press, but that there have been decisions that have been incredibly hurtful. Harry only sees how one side is being hurtful his family. He doesn't see, doesn't want to see, or doesn't want to give the impression that he knows that if anyone has made comments that are intentionally hurtful and ridiculing, it's them. I remember in the car and driving up and he said, you know how to curtsy, right? And I just thought it was a joke. <laughs> Pleasure to meet you, your majesty. Harry turns reality on its head by claiming that he thinks there's probably a lot of people who, after watching the documentary and reading the book, will go, how could you ever forgive your family for what they've done? He then attempts to convince us into believing that people have already asked him that, thus indirectly admitting that he knows most people are going to be skeptical of that, hence his need to mention the alleged support right away. 
Also, forgive what? What has the family done specifically? This attack is as vague as the documentary. Harry keeps simplifying things, saying that the antagonist is the tabloids who want to create as much conflict as possible. He says this whilst deliberately overlooking the conflict that Meghan initially started and that he's taken part of ever since. When I first met my now husband, my British friend said to me, you shouldn't do it because the British tabloids will destroy your life. And I very naively, I'm American, we don't have that there. What are you talking about? Again, he's accusing others of doing what he's doing. He's monopolizing certain words before the opposing side has a chance to. The interviewer asks Harry if it's fair to say that they didn't get on almost from the get-go. Interestingly, Harry says, yeah, fair. This is interesting because he and Meghan gave a much different impression in the engagement interview. Have you you've met each other's families, I imagine? Yes, his family's been so welcoming and, and... You've met quite a few of them, actually. I have, on both sides of his family, his mom's yeah. side as well, which has been really important to me too. But um, yes, the family has been great and over the past year and a half, we've just had a really nice time getting to know them and progressively helping me feel a part of of not just the mm. institution, but also part of the family, which has been really, um, really special. Um, and Catherine's been absolutely um, been wonderful, amazing, as is William as well, you know, fantastic support. If they weren't being truthful in a previous interview, why believe them in a current interview? Just because they say something different today, it doesn't mean that that's the truth. Who's to say if the truth changes two weeks from now? Harry then resorts to another annoying boss word, stereotyping, which sounds strangely similar to Meghan's meaningful podcast, Archetypes. He praises Meghan, saying he doesn't think they were ever expecting him to get in a relationship with someone like Meghan, who had a very successful career. That there was a lot of stereotyping happening. If we consider the context, the context is William and Catherine meeting Meghan. Thus, Harry has an interest in sounding superior to them, as if he exceeded their expectations by choosing Meghan. If William and Catherine had actually had this thought that Harry had outdone himself, there would be no reason to stereotype, as he says. They quote-unquote stereotyped precisely because they had expected him to find someone else, someone better in their view. As a result, this all ends up sounding like Harry's self-comforting lies as to how he ended up in the situation he's in. The exact opposite of what he's claiming 